Welcome to the Albuquerque Journal Midweek Blitz High School Football Show with your hosts, James Yotis and Jeff Grammer. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Jeff Grammer with the Albuquerque Journal, and you are listening now to Week 4's Week of Games for the Midweek Blitz, our high school football show here at the Albuquerque Journal, the Albuquerque Journal Podcast Network, joined as always by high school Prep editor James Yotis. James, welcome. Jeffrey, good to see you. We have a uh, another week of games to uh, to talk about coming up this weekend, Thursday through Saturday. Good slate of games, but uh, this week I want to start by looking back a little bit. There were some uh, some notable games last week, not just on what they may mean big picture wise for particular um, races and and playoff standings, that kind of stuff. But uh, you know, there was one game in particular that. Uh, I think some people may look back on as the most memorable game. Whether or not that makes it the game of the year, maybe the importance doesn't rise to that level. Maybe there wasn't enough defense to be considered by some people a game of the year. But I don't think people are going to forget one game in particular, and it was last week's Thursday night game. You were there. Uh, Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you saw with the Trisco Heritage and El Dorado? Yeah, so this is a game... It'll be really interesting. This is a game that has potential implications down the road, seeding-wise, and I'll explain why in a second. But these two teams combined for over, I think, 1,300 yards, uh, 134 points, which made it the second-highest-scoring regular season game in 11-man history. Uh, And the number one game just happened last year with La Cueva and West Mesa. So uh, it was... (sighs) You get games like this from time to time. I don't especially enjoy them, but this one was so off the rails. Uh, it was it was hard not to get caught up in the fun of it. Uh, you know, Trisco Heritage wins the game seventy to sixty four, and Trisco Heritage never trailed, not even once. Uh, and as a matter of fact, El Dorado was playing catch up the entire game in, in a game with one hundred and thirty four points to not even to, to have a team that didn't even trail once. That's it, you would think it was back and forth, back and forth, and it might have been kind of back and forth, but it was. It was forward uh, for one team, and then the other guys were catching up a lot. Yeah, you know, Trisco was up by as many as 23 points in this game, in the second half, 36-13. And El Dorado just kept at it, kept at it. They finally tie the game with a minute and five left at 64-64. And then they line up for the extra point, which naturally gets blocked. Um, And in hindsight, that probably didn't end up being a a huge play because a Trisco header just came down and won it on a Hail Mary from their backup quarterback that gets deflected at the goal line. And tips up in the air and lands in the hands of a receiver, uh, a kid named Andres Villalobos, who's standing two yards in the end zone and just it falls into his hands. Boom. There you go. Game's over 70 to 64. I, I want to let I have one question about the, the way that game ended, which was that last play of the game. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, the clock was showing 0.1 seconds. One tenth of one second. How right. does that? I mean, how does that even happen? And, and and was it controversial at all, or did people kind of agree uh, there should be some time left? Let me say this: I, I've never had a game that where the clock stopped with one tenth of a second left, and again, especially in a game like this. The second thing I would say: there were a couple of clock issues in the last 20 seconds where the clock stopped and should not have stopped. Interesting. Without a timeout, and I think. Uh, I, I know I know El Dorado feels this way. Uh, I think the penultimate play of this game probably should have ended up being the final play of the game, but it wasn't because uh, there were a couple of plays where the clock was stopped by the officials on the field when it shouldn't have been stopped because there had not been an official timeout yet. So I think there were a few seconds that went off that probably should not have gone off the clock. So, you know, in hindsight, you know, there's no way to know that 100% for sure, but that was my view from the press box. But having said that, to get a clock that stops with a tenth of a second, there were, I think there were 6.1 seconds left, and a Trisco threw a pass down the near sideline, and it fell incomplete, and I my eyes immediately went to the clock above me, and the clock stops with one-tenth. And honestly, the clock operator probably, you know, could have just – let it run for the, that right. extra tenth. But, I mean, he doesn't know what the clock is going to look like. And this wasn't the case, just to yeah. be clear to everybody, where they put time back on the clock or something, no, so they no, got no. another play. I mean, it, it happened in real time. Um, you, you do mention a couple plays that maybe helped out a little bit in those final last couple minutes, but th- this wasn't the case. I mean, you're, you're giving up 134 points in a game. It's kind of hard for either team to be mad about one more play. Yeah, look, 
you know, Trisco was in control most of this game, and maybe that was the the right result was them winning the game. El Dorado was playing catch up the whole way, uh, which which must have been taxing because El Dorado was coming off a short week. They played on Saturday afternoon because their game on Friday got postponed because of lightning. They were coming off a short week, five days. Trisco Heritage had played the previous Thursday and only played basically two quarters, and so their starters didn't really have to play a whole lot. So uh, it was pretty commendable that El Dorado hung as well as they did uh, on a short week in a game that was such a track meet. Um, it's And it's a, a super tough loss. We, and, well, not only is it a, a super tough loss for for El Dorado, like, I, I'm curious what it does psychologically moving forward for a team like that. I think they'll be okay there. I think the bigger issue is what I, what I mentioned right at the start. These are two teams that could easily finish, like, fourth place in their district. Okay. You know the state playoffs take twelve teams. This is a this is exactly the kind of game when we get into the end of October when they select the playoff teams, where you know I don't think Atrisco is yet ready to beat Volcano or Cleveland or Rio Rancho. We'll see. I don't know for sure, but it looks you know it, it would not surprise me if it fell that way. El Dorado could be a fourth place team in its district. You got La Cueva there. You got Farmington there. Sandia's off to a three zero start. Hypothetically, if both these teams were to finish in the same place in their district in fourth place, let's just say. Yeah. What if it came down to one spot? And this is what happened with the Trisco Heritage last year. They got in as a 12 seed because they beat West Mesa like 59-54 in the regular season, which went down to the last minute. Two years in a row, Trisco's had a game like this that maybe... Right. So, yeah, hypothetically, yes, this is a game that could bite El Dorado down the road. So you're talking about psychologically. Short term, I don't think it'll be a big issue. El Dorado's got some kids that can play. They really do. And they had a kid named uh, Josh Jackson who caught four touchdowns in this game. Their quarterback, Brandon Olivas, threw for eight touchdowns, almost a state record in this game. El Dorado, I think, will be okay, but the potential seeding implications down the road could come into play. I don't want to say they will or they won't, but it's certainly possible. Well, what a what a crazy game. And that's, you know, look, every, every game of the week counts in that Thursday night game. Sometimes gives us something to talk about. Sometimes it's it doesn't always give us something to talk about, but that was a Thursday night game, and and uh, I remember following you, following your updates on Twitter at James Yotis, by the way, and um, at James D. I'm sorry, Yotis. at James D. Yotis. I tried and, doing James Yotis, but apparently there was already one out there, so I'd had my middle initial. I, look, I think you're one of a kind. Um, the uh, the updates were crazy, man. They, they were coming fast and furious. I saw TV people in town following you because they had already called it a night. They had to get back to the station. Um, and then <laughs> that um, was yeah. Let me interrupt for a second. That was the first game I think I ever covered a seven o'clock start where the the ten. The 1020, 1025 sports guys literally did not have a final score to report because we went like three and a half hours. That's so crazy. Uh, I think Van Tate, who's usually the last one off the air on Channel 13, uh, 64 64 is what he had. So that was the first game I'd ever covered and the longest game I've ever covered where the TV stations couldn't even give you a final score because, Without a they, delay, were still, of course. Right, because they were still playing. It was, it was just that kind of night. With 134 points, obviously it's one that people are going to remember. Uh, we mentioned a couple names. We're, we're going to get to a couple more of those names a little later when we talk about the players that uh, kind of stood out last week. Latavius Morris, you meant, well, well, we'll get to a few yeah. of them in a minute. Um, last week had some, some obviously some other big games too. You you wrote a column already that 6A needed what happened to it a, a little bit. Um, I thought that was an interesting approach to, to sort of talk about what happened in 6A football last week, which is – a lot of really good teams that that we still I, I think we're still on the same page here are still going to be the the same top handful of teams in 6A are still going to be the same six top handful of teams in 6A at the end of the season we we don't we haven't changed our mind on that at all um but they all have losses and and to see one of those teams at 0 and 3 to see some of these other teams to see Cleveland lose all that kind of stuff uh you know it it makes you uh, makes you raise your eyebrows a little bit. Talk, tell me about what happened with six A football this yeah. past weekend. So we had, I mean, like half the top ten in the coaches poll got beat, starting with number one Cleveland, which had a fifteen point lead in the fourth quarter, but lost in overtime to Amarillo High, twenty eight twenty seven. Cleveland went for a two point conversion to win the game at the end, got stopped, which was the difference in the game. Now we should mention Cleveland was without its sophomore starting quarterback Jordan Hatch, who got hurt in the second half of the La Cueva game, uh, unbeknownst to most of us. So he did not play. So Cleveland was down to his backup quarterback. Long term on the injury? I do not believe it's long term. Uh, okay. Their coach, Robert Garza, told me the other day that they do not believe it'll be long term. Okay. And they better hope it not because their schedule is difficult. Well, not not only do they have a difficult schedule, like they, they have the last couple of years, they've opened really, really tough. Anytime a team, they've become that, that team that, uh, you know, Notre Dame always used to like to call itself. Like anytime somebody plays us, 
they're coming after us, you know, and they are the defending champs multiple times over. So they're getting everybody's best shot every every week. So uh, it's it's interesting when you see Cleveland on the wrong end of that scoreboard. Yeah, it was. And, you know, Cleveland plays Las Cruces High at home this week. Uh, Las Cruces High, much better than they were last year. Then Cleveland goes to Artesia. And then Cleveland plays uh, Friendship Texas up here in Rio Rancho. So they've got a tough stretch coming up. Uh, I believe Jordan Hatch is due to be back uh, shortly. I don't know if it'll be this week or next week, but I believe it's not going to be a long-term absence. So Cleveland loses a game. Okay. Number two, La Cueva loses. They lose to number four, Centennial, 35-28. And, and La Cueva was playing catch-up most of that game, too. Centennial was Centennial was up 21 in the second half of this game. La Cueva got it to seven early in the fourth quarter, uh, but they only got the ball one more time. Centennial with its quarterback, Daniel Hernandez, who was fantastic, uh, did a good job holding the ball. They ran out the last several minutes after La Cueva's final drive kind of petered out uh, inside the 30. So that's a tough loss. La Cueva's 0-3. That's a team you were just referencing yeah. a second ago. They're 0-3 now after the forfeit plus the losses to Cleveland and now to Centennial. And La Cueva's schedule doesn't get any easier. They play Volcano Vista on Friday, who's 3-0. They play Los Lunas next week, who is 3-0. So uh, La Cueva's schedule is not going to let up for a little while. Um, so that was one of the teams that lost. Number five, Rio Rancho got beat pretty good by El Paso East Lake by three touchdowns. I don't think that's a bad loss necessarily. Um, Rio Rancho is still solid there. And you had number six, Farmington lose at home to number seven, Los Lunas, 40-22. to um, and we'll talk more about Los Lunas in a second. Yeah. Uh, and Hobbs is in the top 10. They lost as well to Roswell. So, And I, I actually, I think even El Dorado might have been ranked near the top, bottom of the top 10. And, of course, they lost the game to Otrisco. So we had five or six teams in the top 10 all go down in the same week. And, yes, it's healthy. It just lets everybody know, look, there's, there's some uh, uh, volatility, yeah. for lack of a better word. It just lets, teams, it lets other teams know, look, this team is gettable. Let's let's hang in there. Uh, it's not just a Cleveland monarchy out there. Uh, you know they can be beat, and Cleveland definitely is gettable, more gettable I think than they were last year. Uh, they're still probably the best overall team out there. I don't think there's any question about that. But are they're more gettable I think this year than they probably were a year ago. And we got any number of really good teams. Volcano Vista is a good example. Three, you know, they're playing La Cueva. Zero and three on Friday night. We'll see how legit the Hawks are uh, now that they go up against La Cueva. You had mentioned uh, briefly that one of the opponents coming up for, um, I think you said for Cleveland, Artesia is playing Cleveland, right? Um, we're going to get to them in a second. I want to talk about some teams around the state worth looking at, and yeah. you just saw them up close. I'm going to get to them in a second. I'll put a pin in that for now. I am going to right now kind of go over some of the individual performances, some of the top players from last week, and uh, then we're going to start looking ahead at some teams and um, kind of give us an idea of of where some of these teams stack up as we're we're already, you know, it's week four. We're already kind of at that midway point, approaching that midway point already. And uh, let's, for now, though, um, recap some of the stars of last week. Obviously, we're doing a poll every week that uh, a, a lot of fans, still thousands of people are coming to vote on these uh, stars of the week each week. I'm going to run down, this week I'll, I'll run down in order. Um, I'll go in reverse order from the bottom up. But we had eight players last week that we, we singled out for our poll. People can vote. Um, before I before I mention them, this is something I know you've been asking a lot of high school football coaches for. We we do this obviously. We can't be at every game around the state. Uh, we are asking coaches when you have a star performance, and coaches know which ones rise to this level or not. You, you've got to let us know. You, you've got to reach out to us. Um, we we try our best to to cover every game in the state and get the results as we can. But um, I know you've been pleading to coaches a little bit to, to let you know. Yeah, we just, you know, we want to highlight kids who have big games. Uh, it's difficult sometimes because some teams don't do their stats and their individual stuff until like Sunday or Monday. Like when they watch film, right? And we need them by basically mid, late afternoon Saturday if we want to have a chance to add them to our poll for the top performers of the week. We're, we're never going to get 100% on this, but I'm trying to get the word out to coaches. Uh, and I think it's slowly filtering out. Look, if you have a kid that had a great game, Wherever he plays, right. it doesn't matter whether it's a Class 2A school or a 6A school, let us know. And we can we can get them added to our list and give them a chance to get some exposure. So I, I think we're doing okay with this, but I, I, I know we can do a lot better. And I'm hoping the coaches will start to funnel this information to us so we can add some more versatility. And maybe as I'd love to have... I've, I think I'd love to have like 10 kids. If we had 10 kids Every week. on a poll, I think that's a good number. That's a good round number. It wouldn't necessarily feature everyone that should be on the list. But if we could get 10, I think that'd be great. I think that's a good number for people to uh, 
to have a sample size from and to give a chance to vote. Uh, so that's what I'm looking for. We haven't quite gotten there yet. I'm still hopeful, and I'm, I'm going to keep pushing this with the coaches as best I can. Let us know right away if you have a kid that had a big game, offense, defense, one or the other, special teams, all of that. And tell us, uh, let them know how to how to get a hold of you. Obviously, most of these coaches know how to get a hold of James Otis at this point. But how do they get a hold of you? Yeah, so the ones, uh, you know, they can the coaches who know me can certainly text me, but uh, they can find me on Twitter at James D. Yotis. Uh, my email address is also on my Twitter page, uh, jyotis at abqjournal.com. Send me a message on social media. Send me an email. Send me a text if you know me. A lot of the coaches know yeah. me and have my contact information. Any way you can get it to me, send it to me. And and I can't promise every single kid will end up on the list, but if the numbers are really good and, and the kid had a big impact in a game, yeah, we're going to add him. And we want to, you know, I've already had several coaches who, who gave me some information on kids from last weekend. And I told them, look, y- y- get it to me right away. Right. And we have a chance to do it. I, I can't get it midweek. Yeah, once I we got, start the poll, we're not going to go. We got to have the poll goes out live, I think, on Sunday. So we got to have these things by Saturday. Like I said, some schools do their stats right away. Others kind of wait till Sunday. So, you know, I, it, it kind of depends on the school. But we're going to do our best. And I'm going to continue to push the coaches and ask them to alert us to kids that had big games and let's get them on the poll and and let's have some fun with it all right last week's poll eight players i'm going to read through them real quick i'll give you their percentage at the end of the the top top three players that the last three i'm going to mention got a a significant amount of votes um and and two in particular were well over 30 percent of the vote so uh each so um let's start with daniel hernandez quarter senior quarterback for centennial a game you went down to las cruces and watched hernandez was excellent in the hawks win over la cueva on saturday running for 212 yards and three scores and passing for two others as he gave the bears defense fits andres villalobos senior running back at trisco heritage in that epic win over el dorado villalobos uh, was doing damage all over the field. He caught five passes for 165 yards and three touchdowns, and he also rushed for 77 yards and a touchdown. Josh Jackson, senior wide receiver, El Dorado. Jackson was outstanding in the loss Thursday for Atrisco Heritage. He caught nine passes for 239 yards and four touchdowns, covering 36 yards, 60 yards, 40 yards, and 23 yards on the scores. Jet Gallus, uh, junior running back, Albuquerque Academy, uh, Gals turned in turned on the afterburners to carry the Chargers over Hope Christian 34-14 on Saturday. He tallied 174 yards on 22 carries and found the end zone three, ti- end zone three times. Hunter Maldonado, senior running back for Sandia. Maldonado has emerged as one of 6A's better two-way players. On Friday, he ran for three touchdowns as Sandia remained unbeaten with the 45-9 victory over Albuquerque High. So those are the first five. Now, these next three all got a, a significant chunk of the votes at 17.8%. Latavius Murray, junior quarterback at Trisco Heritage. Could anyone have had a better week three than Morris? All he did in his debut at, his position, at this position was throw for 482 yards and five touchdowns and rush for another 180 yards, including a dazzling 80-yard touchdown scamper. Well, you asked the question there, could anyone have had a better week? The, the voters thought these two guys had better weeks at 30.9%. Brandon Olivas, senior quarterback, El Dorado, in his duel with Morris, was in the own was in his own right tremendous, throwing for 477 yards and eight touchdowns. Only one 11 man quarterback ever has thrown for more scores in a single game in state history. 30.9 percent there, and the winner this week for the star of the week at 33.4 percent of the vote, senior quarterback from Los Lunas, Damasio. Kaneshiro? Kaneshiro. Kaneshiro. Spearheaded the Tigers' most impressive win of 2023 so far, throwing for three touchdown passes and also running in a score in a big 40-22 to road victory Friday night at Farmington. So we already talked about some of these guys. I will ask you now, James Yotis, the, the, the voters have spoken you uh you <laughs> they've wanna, spoken incorrectly they've spoken incorrectly uh, yeah I, look it, your vote goes to latavius morris the kid had never started at quarterback in his life and he threw and actually there was a typo here actually he threw for six touchdowns not okay. five which was my fault he throws for almost 500 yards now much of that to be fair was a lot of uh, run after catch uh short throws that were turned into large gains by his uh his playmakers but uh, you know, he ran for 180 yards, too, and he showed such presence of mind. Uh, and his decision-making, by and large, with only one exception, was so 
excellent for a kid that has no experience at the position. He went out and showed a lot of poise and a lot of uh, maturity that you would not normally see from somebody who'd never played quarterback in his life. And I, I just couldn't believe it when somebody told me during the game, one of the coaches in the press box said, no, he's never played quarterback before. I'm like, how can that be a kid that's playing like this? He was a menace. He's probably wondering what the big deal is. I mean, he's like, you know, he, and yeah, this look, is pretty easy. Look, Latavius is one of uh, the city's best athletes. He's one of, he, and he's a fantastic basketball player for Trisco Heritage. He's excellent. Uh, the basketball community already knows him. Uh, I wrote about him uh, last year uh, a little bit in terms of his football skills. But this was off the charts for a kid that had never played quarterback before, which is why he would have gotten my vote. I don't, I didn't vote, and I don't have a vote. But for a kid to put up 660 plus combined yards when he'd never played quarterback in his life, in a game like this, yeah, that to me, that to me, and like I said, this is all due respect to Brandon Olivas, the quarterback from El Dorado. Eight touchdowns is crazy, and you know, Las Lunas' quarterback, uh, Demacio Kanashiro, great effort, and and that's a big team win for Las Lunas. Uh, a game, I, and I mentioned this last week. That was that was a team I was really interested to watch uh, in week three to see how they went up to Farmington, who came down here and beat them last year. Las Lunas didn't forget; they went up, put it to them uh, last week. So that was to me, and I, I even put this out on Twitter, and I put this in my column the other day. That was for me the best team win I saw from anybody in New Mexico last weekend, more than Centennial, because Centennial is so good. But Las Lunas's win in Farmington was. As good as any any team I saw in week three. Uh, so uh, the quarterback here, Kaneshiro, uh, you know, congrats to him for winning the poll. Like I said, I, I don't. I think the voters uh, and he probably had a good push from Las Lunas, and they love their football. Uh, he wouldn't have been my choice. He wouldn't have been my second choice. He probably wouldn't. He wouldn't have even been my third choice. But man, just keep knocking him down here. No, no, no. I, you know, he had a fantastic game. But everybody on this list James is worthy. It's like board. you know, it's like the Oscars. I mean, they're all worthy. Uh, you know, only one can get it. Uh, so yeah, so congrats to him. But you know, we had some. I mean, we put four kids from that Atrisco Heritage yeah. El Dorado game on the list because we had to, or I should say, I had to. They were they were all so fantastic. There was no way to leave a couple of these kids off right. the list. I didn't. I wouldn't necessarily want to put four kids from one game on a list, but we had to this week. So we had some fantastic efforts, including this Las Lunas quarterback. Uh, you know, who's had to step in for Paul Searmans, who was Las Lunas's quarterback. He graduated who was tremendous the last couple of years for Los Lunas, including leading them to a state title year before last when they beat Artesia. He was tremendous. So this kid had to step into some really big shoes. Now, I have not seen him in person yet, and I'm hoping to at some point. That is a fantastic performance to take that team on the road, play that well against a real what everybody considers to be a pretty solid Farmington team and put up 40 points. Yeah, I mean, fantastic effort for him. That puts a bow a little bit... Uh... It'll keep coming up, I'm sure, throughout the season, some of these games. But that puts a bow on what, what we saw last week and kind of the bigger picture for some of those performances individually and um, for uh, for the teams. Let's start looking ahead a little bit, not only to the game specifically this week, but I, I want to pose this question to you. I want to ask you um, if you can – First of all, if you can give us um, a look or give us an idea of some teams that, that we should be kind of paying attention to, maybe they don't have a big game this week. What I want to do is twofold here. Why don't you tell me some of the big games this week, but I also want you to tell us about your in-person um, look at Artesia. I know you got to see them. They're a team that's one of the best teams in the state. I'm curious on Artesia, by the way. Let, let's start there because I'm curious. Where would Artesia rank? We keep mentioning these these teams at the top of 6A. Where would Artesia rank in 6A? I think with this particular group of teams, I think five or six probably. No, Maybe no worse than five. Uh, I think you can include them with some of these other teams. Um, watching them last week, it wasn't a great sample size just because they were playing Belen. Belen's down a little bit. Uh, so Artesia beat them pretty good. They beat them 51 to nothing. Uh, and it was I think it was 36 nothing at halftime. So this wasn't a major test. Uh, as a matter of fact, of all the games on Artesia's schedule, this one probably – uh, was the the I don't know what the right phrase is. Uh, this one tested them less than probably any other game on their schedule. So, as you all know, it's like you know, can you judge the Lobos in a in a in a scrimmage against the New Mexico Highlands? No, you need to see them play somebody like St. Mary's or the Aggies or whoever. So uh, it's hard to say exactly what we'll get from them. But having said that, they beat up on Hobbs, they beat up on Carlsbad, two six eight teams. Uh, they've got Cleveland coming to town uh, a week from this Friday. So. They've been they've been tremendous. Them and Roswell. Um, and you were talking about games to watch. 
you know, uh, we talked about the Cueva playing Volcano Vista on Friday. And we should mention Mason Posa, the uh, the fantastic junior linebacker for La Cueva. Yeah. He got dinged up pretty good a couple of times in the Centennial game. I, don't know, I do not know if he'll play against Volcano. That would be a big loss if he doesn't. Uh, I don't know. He left the field the other day with a big ice pack on his right leg. It's not knee-related, I don't believe, but they need him. The Quaven needs him to play. And, and this is a kid who just got four Power 5 offers uh, in the first two days of this week. Washington, Wisconsin, Cal, Arizona State. Two of them on Monday, two of them on Tuesday. It's funny how when they come, they a lot of them come. And sometimes right. there's, a, there's a team or a, a coach somewhere waiting to see somebody else do it because they're just a little bit iffy on it. But then once they get that first offer, three or four other schools that have been watching them closely jump in pretty quickly. Right, so three of the four schools are from the Pac-12, the soon-to-be dissolved yeah. Pac-12 uh, you know, with these teams scattering around. So Mason is picking up momentum. He's a tremendous player. So we don't know if he's going to play. But having said that, this game, La Cueva and Volcano Vista, is still a fantastic matchup Friday night, Community Stadium. Volcano's 3-0. La Cueva's 0-3. Uh, and La Cueva still will probably end up being higher ranked in this game than Volcano. The second game I would want to mention, Las Lunas at Roswell. Okay. Now, Las Lunas is 3-0. Now, Las Lunas and Roswell had a fantastic rivalry when they were both in Class 5A. Then Las Lunas jumped up... Uh, before the 2022 season, and now they're a 6A school. Roswell is playing tremendous football. We need to say that. They beat they beat Hobbs the other day by almost as many points as Artesia did. Uh, I think they won 34-6. to uh, They've got a tremendous quarterback, Manny Fuentes. This is a really good group. They are going to push Artesia when the time comes. They are going to push Artesia. These two are... These two have separated, in my mind, as the two best teams in 5A. So Roswell is playing at the Wool Bowl on Friday against Las Lunas. So you got 3-0 Roswell, 3-0 Las Lunas. Don't be thrown by the fact that Roswell's in 5A and Las Lunas in 6A. This is a great matchup, especially yeah. with Las, Las Lunas coming up, this road win at Farmington. Now this matchup takes on even more meaning. Um, and these two teams already had a really good rivalry when they were both in 5A. So that's a matchup I love. And the third one, which is way off the radar for me, but it's St. Michael's and Los Alamos. Okay. A pair of 3-0 and teams. Uh, St. Mike's has already beaten both the other Santa Fe teams. So... St. Mike's obviously is is kind of in in contention every year. Or yeah. They're they're obviously really good every year. But what do they have this year that makes them? Uh, you know, why is why are, why is a Los Alamos matchup in week four one that's uh, on your radar? Well, first we should say I I talked to Joey Fernandez, the St. Mike's longtime coach, and and yeah. he said they were they were retooling quite a bit. So they've come out. They've already beaten two six A schools. They're a three A school. They've already beaten the two six A schools in town, Capital and Santa Fe, on back to back weeks. So number one, they have that King of Santa Fe title, which frankly I know they must love lording oh, yeah. over the Santa Fe community and the Capital community, yep. as, as they should. They're three classes below those two schools. They've beaten them both on back to back weeks. Now they play Los Alamos, a five A school who is three and zero, and Los Alamos is off to a really good start. They came from behind to beat Capital last week, twenty three to twenty. The Hilltoppers were a playoff team last year. They won their district. Uh, Valley is in that district too. They're off to a really good start. So, I, of course, I I don't have a lot of firsthand information about Los Alamos, but putting them with St. Mike's, we'll see. Because Los Alamos, to me. I, it's a better team than Capital. It's a better team than Santa Fe, even though Los Alamos is a 5A school. So I love this matchup between St. Michael's and Los Alamos. It's one of the sneaky, under-the-radar best matchups of the weekend. We'll see how legit uh, either team might be. Like I said, even though there are two classes right. apart, in skill level, they're pretty much they're going to be pretty equal. So don't, don't get caught up looking at one team being a 3A school, one team being a 5A school. Uh, they're they're going to be pretty even. I would expect a, a really close matchup. On Friday, and we'll see. St. Mike's is the proven program. Los Alamos is not. They're not there yet, even though they were in the playoffs last year. You know, St. Mike's is still the team that has the cachet, the name, uh, the reputation, uh, the playoff experience. They have all of that. Los Alamos does not. So, uh, this game I think is more important to Los Alamos than it is to St. Mike's. Uh, for that very reason. So I, I'm really fascinated to see that game as well. I know one other team, just record-wise, that I think is probably worth a mention. Um, you had mentioned them, so so I'm bringing them up. It's not uh, off the top of my head necessarily, but Bernalillo's off to a 3-0 start. You you thought that was worth a, worth a mention. Bernalillo's playing a lot of good football. Uh, they beat Valley the first week, um, and then they beat Espanola, and they beat Del Norte pretty handily. Uh, so they're going to get more tests going forward. And they're in a district with Portales, who's great, Lovington, an academy. That's a brutal district. That is an absolutely brutal district. But this team is really good defensively. Uh, and I saw them play Valley. They held Valley to no points. Uh, Valley's only touchdown was a kickoff return. So this defense is really good now, and, and they're going to need to be 
when we get into October when they start playing against some of these really good district teams. Their non-district schedules not going to test them a whole lot right. until we get into their district slate. But yeah, they're playing fantastic football. They're a four-year program. They're they're moving up in the rankings slowly. Uh, I believe they're sixth or seventh in the latest coaches poll. So the other coaches are starting to take notice. And like I said, the, the Wendover Valley, uh, which is a which fancies itself as a as a good five A team, and Valley's won the two games since they lost to Bernalillo, yeah. uh, and they're slowly getting their act together. But yeah, Bernalillo is one of those teams to kind of sneaky watch. Teams are not okay. going to pay much attention. Now they're going to have to beat one of the four eight teams on their schedule to really catch people's attention and to give themselves a chance to be a playoff team. They're going to have to beat Academy. They're going to have to beat Lovington. I don't think they can beat Portales. Portales is really good. Portales would be a top five team in 5A, okay. in my opinion. But Burnley is going to have to beat one of those. They're going to have to beat either Lovington or Academy in their district, I think, if they want to get to the playoffs. We'll see. Uh, you know, you, you always want to, you know, they need to win some games now because they know how tough their district is. So they need to stockpile some wins early and help their resume as much as they can. The win over Valley certainly will help, especially if Valley goes on to win its district. So, uh, yeah, I, that's a team I'm really I'm, I'm keeping an eye on going forward. I'm going to keep a, a close eye. they got some kids that can play. Last note on some teams to sort of watch. You mentioned Los Lunas quite a bit, so we don't need to go over them again, but three teams left in 6A that are undefeated. Um, can you give us a, a quick little bullet point on 3-0 and Sandia and uh, Volcano Vista we've talked a little bit about, but give us a little nugget on, San, on both yeah, of those Yeah, so, teams. you know, Sandia beat Atrisco the first week, 21-20, really good win. Uh, and in hindsight, for them to have held Atrisco Heritage <laughs> to 20 points looks pretty phenomenal. Um, and then they shut out Piedra Vista, who's a bit – rebuilding after being in the state final last year in 5A. Uh, and then Sandy beat up on Albuquerque High the other night, 45-9. to nine. Um, We'll see. Sandy plays Volcano Vista next Thursday, uh, as we're sitting here Wednesday. So that's eight days from now. Yep. So they're both 3-0 at the moment. Will they still both be 3-0? Or will they still be both undefeated when we get to next Thursday night? I don't know. Um, we'll have to see. But Sandia's, Sandia's defense has been playing really well. Uh, we talked about Hunter Maldonado. He's one of our stars this week. Uh, he's been very good on both sides of the ball for Coach Adcox, uh, who's not pleased with his offense yet. Uh, okay. He's very pleased with the way his defense has been playing. Like I said, to hold Trisco to 20 in hindsight looks like a tremendous accomplishment. So uh, as the offense starts to find its way a little bit, uh, we'll see. That could be a team that might have a chance to finish near the top of its district. I don't think they're quite equipped to beat a team like La Cueva, but maybe – they're good enough to beat El Dorado. Maybe they're good enough to beat Farmington. So that's a team maybe as we get into October. Yeah, maybe they might be able to fight for maybe a top eight seed if they can win those those games. West Mesa, and West Mesa, of course, as well is in that district, and they're, and they're formidable as well. So, But Sandy's got a chance to compete against all those teams I think with that defense, so that's going to be a fun. That's going to be a fun chase. I'm going. I'm just going to say, La Cueva should win this district. I don't think there is any question about that in my mind. That leaves these other teams: El Dorado, Farmington, Sandia, West Mesa, battling and jostling for playoff positions. So uh, I like Sandia. Uh, I like what I've seen so far. Uh, I'll know more after I see them play Volcano Vista next week, and we'll see how how ready for prime time they are. That's good. Uh, we're in the middle, kind of approaching that midway point of the season already in week four right now. Um, so it's good to hear that uh, so many teams have still plenty to play for. Um, and uh, we will wrap it up uh, with this. I, I do want, as always, to remind people that this podcast is coming out every week, the Midweek Blitz. We are. It is a part of a larger Albuquerque Journal digital movement, really, these podcasts and, and some of this digital content that we're doing. Uh, this will be dropping on Thursdays now. Um, we are going to drop this show every Thursday uh, ahead of that week of games. Um, Thursday night is when that week of games starts. So we've got a lot going on at the Albuquerque Journal, though. There's a lot of high school content. It's not just football either. I want to mention really quickly, although the games, the matches have already started, uh, your high school volleyball preview is online right now, and it was in today's newspaper, uh, the print edition. Uh, but abqjournal.com slash sports for, for a statewide really look at um high school volleyball focusing primarily player wise certainly on the metro area and um but high school volleyball is going at it the metro tournament for soccer is down to is semifinals it, tonight semifinals uh, wednesday night and tonight the championship tonight games friday night so friday night championship game for the metro championships boys and girls for soccer uh it's not just football going on i know a lot of people listening to this in particular are interested in football but james i Appreciate you, as always, for, for knowing more about high school football than anybody else in the state of New Mexico, in my opinion. Um, what game are you going to this week? 
Uh, I'll be at Albuquerque get- High West Mesa on Thursday. I'm doing soccer Wednesday night, Friday night, uh, so I'm not doing the La Cueva Volcano game. Um, and then Saturday, I'm going to catch a little bit of St. Pius. They're playing Del Norte. Okay. And Farmington is in town to play Cibola, so I'm going to catch a little bit of both of those games. Staying busy. Obviously, staying busy. We'll have plenty to talk about again next week on the Midweek Blitz. Tune in. Um, abqjournal.com will get you there. We're also going to be putting some video up, stuff like that. So appreciate you guys for listening. As always, give us your feedback. Send it. Twitter, we're both available. Um, email ggrammer at abqjournal.com. Yotis at abqjournal.com. You can just send it to sports at abqjournal.com. Our whole department will get it that way. <laughs> but uh, give us your feedback. Tell us what you'd like us to talk about in future shows, what you like or don't like about these shows. We can take it. Let us know. Um, without you guys, it's... Uh, None of this matters, so thank you for listening. Thank you for watching this week's edition of the Midweek Blitz. Thanks for listening to the Albuquerque Journal Podcast Network. I'm Patrick Etheridge, Executive Editor of the Albuquerque Journal. Since 1880, the Journal has been New Mexico's most trusted news source and the largest daily newspaper in the state. But we're so much more than that. We're a family-owned news company committed to serving our customers across numerous platforms, Sure, we still have a daily newspaper. We've got a number of active social media accounts and a digital news site that's updated 24 seven. Our commitment to Albuquerque and all of New Mexico is to bring the news to you. Our podcast network is one more way that we deliver the news to you every day. Whether you read, hear, or watch, we've got you covered. We hope you'll check back often as we have a number of exciting new products rolling out in the near future. Until then, thanks again for listening. Have a great day. And remember, read, hear, watch.